there was and always has been a very indoor focus to the creative process for many artists. I remember reading an essay in which Claude Monet commented that because of Impressionism, art had broken out of the dark, dreary walls of the museum and into the bright sunshine. To be an artist means remaining connected with the observable world. Plain air painting, the French words literally mean open air painting, is the core of my life as a studio artist. It is by returning wide-eyed to encounter nature again and again that emotions, impressions, and inspiration can grow. Life itself is the foundation of the most significant art of every generation. is something very jewel-like about a plein air. It is a small piece of canvas that has been crafted and done on location. And the brushwork has a great sense of reality to it, a great sense of authenticity. Here's just a random sampling of a few recent uh, plein air paintings. Every one of these is an experience just etched in my mind, an indelible memory uh, that is recorded in paint. For example, Napa Valley. I was recently in the Napa Valley. Now, of course, Napa Valley is known for the wine uh, that comes from that region, but it's also a beautiful region uh, in terms of wildflowers. And one of the great things is they have so many fields of mustard, and the mustard just comes up underneath all the vineyards. And so when I was here, of course, the mustard was starting to come up, and you can see it. It was an overcast day, and yet you look in the distance and you can see the hills on the other side of the valley. Just a little barn, just a pastoral scene as I sat there and, and sketched in the fresh air and watched the daily activities of the farm. People would come out and work and go back in, and they never noticed me over there standing there, standing in their field. Uh, if they had, they probably would have come over and asked me to pitch in and do some work. But, um, you know, what a memory uh, to have been in Napa Valley. And we go from there to regions as diverse as uh, the island of Maui. Again, just here's a setting, a beautiful setting that I stumbled upon with a pond and it had lily pads and the beautiful ferns and uh, palm trees and so forth that were growing along the banks. And I just set up and in an hour or two uh, recorded the beauty of this tranquil setting. Later that uh, week, or it may have even been earlier in the week, I set up and did a, a view on a beach, just a typical Hawaiian beach with the distant clouds. This is the other side of Maui. You can see up here in the distance another island that's actually the same island. It's the other end of Maui as it sort of makes a L and goes back around. And the clouds are gathered up on the top of the mountain there. But again, sitting in the sunlight, um, hearing the sound of waves crashing in the distance, the smell of the ocean, seagulls overhead, you know, it doesn't get much better than that. In a world in which information is coming at us from all sources, immediately, the computers are in everything we pick up, whether they are toys or telephones. At this moment in time, when we seem to be so programmed and so accessible, I mean, where things are so accessible to us, I think we have a way of responding to that by in some way going backwards in time to something which is more tangible, which is more immediate, which is more lasting, as it were. We go back to nature, we go back to family, we go back to religion, we go back to the things which have always been there. The values, the support systems, um, that really have nothing to do with computer chips, which have nothing to do with speed and technology and, and all of these services which are available to us. It isn't to say that those things are necessarily bad, but I don't think they really address the fabric and the fiber of our lives, which is really tied up in things much more long-lasting and permanent and important in many ways than all of these gadgets that are available to us. So I think artists in general today and Thomas Kincaid in particular are really addressing that. It's, they're giving us the handmade, they're giving us the things which have been there before. 
You can look at a Thomas Kincaid painting of Yosemite and you can then go to a museum and see a painting by Bierstadt of the exact same location. Now, I'm not too far from a location. In fact, I think this probably is the exact location where Albert Bierstadt painted in the 1880s. And when I came back to Yosemite after seeing that, I thought, I'm gonna track down the exact location where Albert Bierstadt painted. Now, for those of you who don't know, Albert Bierstadt is a very famous American epic landscape painter. I number him in the top five of people who've influenced me and influenced my work. He was a 19th century painter but he painted luminous sunsets and dramatic vistas of Yosemite Valley. Very emotionally charged, very little connection to what you really see. I mean, he idealized it quite a bit. You know, there's something about being an artist and being on location. Uh, I can't explain it to, to artists who tell me, no, I don't want to do that. And I try to explain, and they say, well, I get it just as much by just going on location and maybe taking my sketchbook and taking a few photographs and coming home. Well, believe me, it's a different experience when you sit down and you're watching the waterfall and you're watching the mist go over those mountains. What a fascinating and beautiful uh, statement of God's grace as we look out at this setting. The choice of materials and process is imp very important with plein air painting, most importantly because you have to carry everything with you normally, in generally speaking. I mean, the normal routine is for somebody to travel to England or to hike up a hill. And anybody who's involved in outdoor sports knows that every additional ounce is something, is an ounce that you're going to have to carry with you for miles and for hours at a time. So you better be sure that you want that extra weight, that it's important to the process. So a plein air painter will make sure that he or she has only the essentials, only things which support the process, which are adaptable to the process, and will be useful in creating the painting. Thomas has to choose the right supplies, just as any other plein air painter would be choosing their supplies for the portability, lightweight, carrying facility, and also the, the range of, of expression that's possible once you get to that location. And then you have to come up with the paints. What paints will I need in order to get the most out of this scene? What brushes will help me achieve that? What kind of surface will I paint on? Those are all decisions you have to make when you're getting ready to, to paint. And Thomas Kincaid has talked about the fact that that preparation is also part of the mental process involved in getting yourself ready for the experience. Now what I have here to, to begin to illustrate the nuts and bolts of plein air painting. This is a complete studio. This is every bit as equipped as the studio that I normally utilize in my indoor finished painting technique. My studio setup here consists of a wide array of brushes. We have about six or seven different types of brush I use. Everything from broad stroke brushes to, to fine point brushes to stipple brushes, which are brushes that you use pointing straight at the canvas as opposed to stroking. And all of those brushes, and combined with the 20 color palette, I use 20 different colors, including white, to mix on all this big setup here and this huge easel and all the other material and paraphernalia uh, is what is involved in doing a studio work. Well, this is all that's involved in doing plein air technique. This little backpack can be packed up and taken with me into a beach somewhere, 100 miles from nowhere, and I can actually create finished works using this, this setup. Now, let me open it up and give you a little guided tour of the plein air uh, studio. This uh, is an ordinary camera tripod. It's a rather a nice tripod in that it has uh, some features that I find really, really useful. Uh, for example, um, it's got complete universal movement on the head here. And it also doesn't have the traditional screw mount that you find on most tripods, uh, but it has a clip mount. Now, what I've done is I've taken my painting box, which is just, this started out just as a kind of a wooden box that I've uh, just gradually modified. I mounted a brushed aluminum plate. It's about an eighth inch aluminum plate on the bottom. Onto that, I mounted the camera tripod plate. 
Now, the great advantage of that is that now I can take this and it literally just sets on there and that's all you have to do. It just clips right on there and we have a ready-made setup. Now, this tripod ha pod has another advantage in that the legs have a three position fix so that they can be the standard uh, position and two other larger angles which give us the ability to work very low and still have about a three foot diameter uh, mount. So <clears throat> great stability in the wind. Now when you open this up, and I'll turn it around so we can all see, um, when you open it up we have a box that features just about everything I need. Now instead of my 20 color palette that I utilize uh, in the studio, I utilize five colors, a simple five color palette. There's a yellow, there's a red, there's a mid-tone brown, there's a luminous green, and a blue. Five colors plus white make up the palette and it pretty much allows you to mix uh, anything you want uh, and, uh, and to represent just about any, any color you can find in nature. Underneath the uh, palette, uh, we see the various paraphernalia. I have an assortment of brushes, um, container for turpentine, uh, the tubes of paint themselves, uh, and believe it or not, I even have a mall stick or painting stick that I utilize uh, that folds right up and goes into my palette so that I can keep my hand suspended above my mixing area and above the painting so I can still do detail uh, with the painting. It's hard to know exactly when plein air painting was first attempted by artists. It's assumed that in the 17th century, for example, artists would take their paints with them out into a garden or a courtyard when they were called to court to paint a portrait of the prince or a noble person. And to fill in their time, they would do these pictures to amuse themselves. They were never exhibited, they were never sold, they were just done for the artist's amusement, but it began that process of painting directly from nature and to honing one's ability to perceive and record on canvas directly in front of the subject. We do know that by the end of the 18th century, it was absolutely essential for a young artist who hoped to make a career in the profession to go to Italy and to uh, paint outdoors in the Roman Forum, in the landscape, and as they were absorbing the influence of the old masters in the museums, they were also painting from nature and learning what that experience was all about. Artists really didn't think that there was any importance to the work except to them personally as part of their education because the hierarchy of the time was all about studio work. The most important pictures were the history paintings, great scenes of battle or mythology or religion. Those were the things which artists aspired to, which collectors appreciated, which really made an artist's reputation. Next would be portraiture, which was one of the most common ways for an artist to ply his trade was to do portraits. And then to a much lesser extent, still life and landscape. It was not very important at the time. but. Things began to change in the middle of the 19th century for a number of reasons. In the United States, for example, artists discovered that painting the landscape, particularly outdoor painting, set them apart from everything that had gone on in Europe before. And the Hudson River School painters and others who worked at that period established what was the first truly American school of art in that they would go out on location, often on teams led by scientists and they would document what they discovered. I mean, it's hard for us to think back now and realize that in the middle of the 19th century, Niagara Falls was an exotic place for people, even as close as it is now to New York City. I mean, we think of it as being very close. In 1872, for example, Thomas Moran came back from Wyoming with a collection of watercolor paintings of these unusual geysers and waterfalls that no one imagined existed. And when those paintings were passed around among the members of Congress, they said, we have got to do something to, to really hold on to this, to make it part of the national image, the national pride. And in 1872, really based on Moran's paintings, they declared Yellowstone to be the first national park. 
Shortly after that, Yosemite was included. Then they looked at paintings of the Grand Canyon and they had the same experience they saw. They said to themselves, my goodness, look at the country that we have here. Look at the wealth, the resources. This is something about which we can really be proud. And what's even harder is to understand that we got this information from artists who were out painting on location. They would take their supplies in by camel, by horse, um, making great dangerous voyages to these locations in order to bring back documents of what people came to realize was their country. So the artists were part of a very important era for the American history, for its consciousness, for its sense of self, um, and that changed the course of history for American artists. Now they had something which was their own, uh, a point of view which was important, and in fact in the middle of the 19th century one of the great debates that went on between philosophers and critics and scholars was whether or not it was important for an artist to go out and did their paintings thereby become more honest and moral and direct because they were working directly from nature? I mean, it, again, it's hard for us to think that painting represents a moral question. Um, nobody except maybe Tom Kincaid talks about art as, a, as an effort to record beauty and to lift people's spirits. But in the 19th century, it was assumed that that was the job of an artist. An artist was there to show people what life could be like, what was the best of the world that we had to enjoy. They did that by going out on location, painting their pictures and bringing them back to the gallery and showing people. The greatest of the painters from that period is a Frenchman by the name of Camille Corot, who on several occasions in the early 1800s, 1820, 1830, made a couple of trips to Rome and created what many people think are among the greatest landscape paintings of all time. All of them done on location with no, very few figures in them. They were mostly pure landscape paintings of the Roman Colosseum, the Forum, the uh, Vatican City, all of those notable locations that interested artists of that period. And he carried that with him throughout his career. And that's much the way that Thomas Kincaid has worked throughout his career. For the last 30 years or more, he has combined this process of painting directly from nature with painting in the studio. One influences the other, one feeds the other, one inspires the other. And they're really part of the same process of getting to know something well enough that you can share it with another person. It's interesting to me, and it really kind of connects with Tom Kincaid's interest in painting, that when in later years when Corot was the head of the French Academy and was in an internationally celebrated artist for his landscape paintings, he called these paintings souvenirs, meaning that to him they kind of refreshed his memory about what it was like to be in Italy at the time, painting from nature, under the influence of the wind, the, the heat, all of those things which became part of the process of learning directly from nature. Likewise, they would do what Corot did and what Thomas Kincaid does now, which is to also use those paintings as a way of developing large studio pictures. So Albert Bierstadt would take his notes about what Buffalo looked like, what the, the hillside looked like in Wyoming, what Native American costumes were like, and he would take that information into his studio and then combine it with his own imaginative sense of the landscape and create these enormous canvases which were all about mystery and magic and wonder while they still offered accurate information about the American landscape. And Tom Kincaid does really the same thing. He always goes out on location, he carries his paints with him everywhere, he collects this information and he takes it back to his studio. The plein air pictures have just as much merit and value, but they become part of a process of stimulating his imagination, recreating experiences in his mind and in his heart that then become part of the studio paintings. That's exactly the same thing that happened 150 years ago, 200 years ago. It's really a, a tradition that has deep roots in the experience of artists and in particular the experience of American artists. The first painting we acquired might have been something that was very specific to our experience. We know that location. 
We've been in Carmel, we know exactly where Thomas was. After we've lived with that for a while, we, we may go back into the gallery and say, you know what, I wasn't looking at that little plein air painting last time, but you know, it, it's starting to grow on me. I love the way that now this picture of Carmel is a little different. It's, it doesn't have those children's names on the awnings, but you know, it, the light is still as magical. The atmosphere is still there. So it's a different kind of experience, but it's just as valuable. And it's still, in the end, it gets to the heart of the experience that the artist had, which he then shares with you. There's a great love of detail and a great love of the mood that you can get in a studio work, but I also find a great love of the explosion of energy that you get outdoors uh, when you are setting up and painting direct from nature. I heard a great painter one time say that when you work in the studio, you paint. When you work outdoors, it paints. And it's really true, the painting sort of paints itself. Nature tells you what to do. And uh, your job as an artist is to put it together in as quick a fashion as you can. And those paintings retain a spark of charm to them that you just don't get in any other kind of work. It's almost as though if it's a seaside scene, you can sort of sense that little pebbles of sand are embedded in the paint. Or if it's a street scene, you have the dust of the street in the paint somehow. One painter put it this way, that it was as though fresh air were captured on canvas. He recognizes that people have hard lives, that things don't always go the way you'd like it. It's not that he or anyone else is naive or is a, an escapist. They're saying that, look, we know all of that exists. Why do we have to dwell on it? Why can't we talk about something that lifts us up, that makes us appreciate life to a greater extent? And he believes, and I believe along with him, is that it's something an artist can do that maybe a musician or a writer can do, but very few people get that opportunity to say, I can make your life richer, more enjoyable, I can give you a kind of pleasure that is different than anything else you can enjoy as a person. I can show you something magnificently beautiful. I can help you look at the sky when at the sun is setting and the colors are golden and the clouds are like these imaginative forms out in the space and say that this is such one of those unusual things which you're lucky enough to experience and to remember through the painting. What a wonderful thing to have happen in a person's life to share that experience through Thomas Kincaid's paintings. There's no question that because of Thomas Kincaid's career and his ability to share his work with thousands and thousands of people, he's one of the most influential artists alive today. His paintings have allowed him to share his vision with a greater number of people than probably any other living artist. And you know, so that makes him, by definition, a very important contemporary artist, somebody who is part of the American culture, part of the international culture, really, because he is doing what an artist is supposed to do and what an artist does better than anybody else, which is to share his or her view of the world, his or her experience in the world, to make it part of everyone's experience.